In recent years, climate change in the environment has shot up the agenda in political and public discourse, and a new type of politics has taken shape, with many people calling for urgent radical change. In this month's Between the Lines, IDS director Melissa Leach, Ian Schoons and Pete Newell discuss their co-edited book, The Politics of Green Transformations. Drawing on international examples, they reflect on past transformations as examples of positive change and examine the factors that have contributed to recent heightened awareness and emergency narratives. They discuss the tensions between the need for urgent green transformations and issues of inequality, social justice and rights and call on an evidence-based politics of hope to drive humanity towards a sustainable and just future. Interviewing them is Andrew Sims, author, political economist, activist and the coordinator of the Rapid Transition Alliance. Well, we're sitting here in late 2019 talking about a book which actually came out in in 2015 about the politics of green transformations. And of course, one of the extraordinary things is that perhaps back in 2015, we did not foresee the speed with which the green agenda, the ecological and environmental agenda, the climate agenda would move forward. So um, bringing in Ian, who brought the volume together, perhaps it would be interesting to ask you to begin with whether you foresaw the scale and speed with which the agenda would move forward? I don't think we did, but I think we thought at that time that injecting a critical political perspective on green transformations was was really crucial. I mean, this was a time in the build-up to the Climate Change Summit in Paris, the SDGs, that environmental questions were coming to the fore. But they were very often framed simply around either a technical or a market-focused approach. And politics, while it was obviously there, was often, often not being talked about. So that's why it's very explicitly the politics of green transformations. And the idea of transformations was very much thinking, this isn't just a, a simple transition from state X to state Y. This was about a more fundamental change, a political change, structural change very often, in the way we both think about and address environmental questions, whether that's around climate change, energy policy, food and so on, all of which are examples in the book. So I think the, the, the polit- politics focus is perhaps risen up the agenda since that time. Now, the book talks um, about a a range of the dynamics involved in green transformations, about the role of the state, about the role of finance, about the dynamics of mobilisation. With all of those, if you were to look back over the last year to two years, where would you see as being the most profound seeds of the current level of interest Well, I think one of the arguments we make in the book is that transformations necessarily emerge out of the interaction of four processes. Technological are there, for sure. Markets are there. States have to be involved. And citizens. And I think a lot of the cases in the book that are discussed show how those those necessarily intersect, that the real transformations happen not just through a market-led change or a state-led change, but by the combinations of each. In respect of what's happened in the last few years, I think the rise of citizen mobilisation around these questions, whether we're thinking of Extinction Rebellion or the climate strikes or whatever, have been really crucial. And it's the intersection of those with the way we think about the politics of of environmental and climate change, and indeed justice uh, in that, um, that have really, really, to my mind, come to the fore. So um, protest and activism have been a pretty permanent feature of the environmental sphere um, going back to the Earth Summit and before that. What do you think has been different about the last couple of years, which means that the interventions or the actions, um, for example, perhaps of a 15-year-old Swedish schoolgirl, have been so different this time around? Why has it taken off now when it hasn't or didn't 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago? I think the the broader conditions that we see today have changed. I mean, I think you know we only have to to look at the way debates are happening across the European Union, even in this country, uh, at a state level. I think people are thinking about these these issues. We've had these big summits. Global political attention has been brought to bear uh, 
maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that, that level of, of attention wasn't there. That, that gives the opportunity, a moment, a space for these type of citizen perspectives to find and hold root. But you can't just end there. I mean, I think there's, a, there's sometimes a, a sense that, yeah, we're all relying on Greta Thunberg to change, change the world. But actually, it's a much broader process of, of mobilization around a whole array of things. So examples in here you know, range from you know, technological development around uh, renewable energies, around transition towns and, and new ways of, uh, of developing urban development, around new forms of economy, grassroots innovation of various sorts. So. Mm -hmm. I think we have to think about citizen mobilization and in its intersections with other forms of transformation in a more rounded sense, which is why, again, we, th this, was, this was, again, the aim of the book now, which I think mm. you know, has, its, has its resonance today. Um, I wanted to bring um, Melissa in at that mm. point, um, because the book presents a, a complex and nuanced theorization of how green transformations happen. But I wonder, sitting here and now in late 2019, the degree to which you think the reality of how change has been emerging matches the theory. Well, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the, I think one of, part of the context, to go back to your last question about why now, why is there this attention, I think science has got something to do with it as well. And what we're looking at over the last year or two has been a quite powerful combination of, of, of scientific knowledge and the work of the IPCC and some scientific spokespeople combined with that citizen mobilisation, which has now drawn a, a level of, of attention. And I think this is also in a context where we've got rising global inequalities and national inequalities and some real dissatisfaction with forms of, of life and livelihood. And, and actually, there's a potency there in, in the arguments for change. And in that respect, I think this book was quite prescient because that combination hadn't yet become so apparent as it is now in the arguments, the really good arguments we're seeing now for not just green new deals, but green and just new deals, which are addressing people's concerns with livelihoods, employment, marginalisation, as well as the more classically green issues. So I think that is what's partly at stake. Now, I think if we look at how change happens, what we argue in the book is that it is a going to be a combination of state, market-led, technology-led and citizen-led approaches. And it's not a flip. It's not a, it's not a kind of technical process of transition. It's often a more incremental and longer-term process of quite fundamental and structural change. And this is why I think the other thing we've seen over the last year, the, the kind of framing of climate emergency, environmental emergency, Emergency, the kinds of arguments that Extinction Rebellion and others are making. On the one hand, they've been, they've been very powerful in garnering attention, but they also create a sense of urgency, of deadlines, that is often quite hubristic in terms of the real challenges ahead. We're not dealing with things to which there are quick solutions, but actually quite complex human and, and ecological predicaments which need to be addressed on all sides through sometimes slower structural change. And I think there's also a danger that that emergency framing, and particularly when it goes along with funerals for species and, 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 and those images, very powerful images of, of dying coral reefs and disintegrating ice flows can actually serve to kill off the kind of politics of hope, which is a phrase I think we didn't use in the book, but are very much using, using now in terms of garnering the kind of enthusiasm for changes that can be good, good for people and good for ecology and actually give us the sorts of transformations to a, a more livable and just world that so many want to see. It's rare in this setting that you get distinctive new voices. And even though um, the environment and green transformations are fundamentally an issue of intergenerational equity or justice or, or, or injustice, and very often you hear the sake of future generations being invoked in the environmental discourse very freely, but the arrival of a self-confident and centred youth voice in this debate with the Youth Strike for Climate Movement does seem to be something which is genuinely different. Uh, what would you attribute their emergence on the scene to? Well, I think a, 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 a genuine, quite woke consciousness of the predicament that we're all in, um, fresh thinking, uh, a, a new generation which is 
quite rightly blaming faults on on current incumbents of power. Um, and I, mean, I think the argument that's being made by young people is not just about the rights and needs of future generations. I think it's also also about the failures of a current generation. And I think it, it goes along with the, the, the rise in consciousness and interest and political engagement of many, many young people, frankly. And it's a very, very excellent thing to, to see. It's not happening through conventional forms of democratic politics. I mean, actually, this is a different sort of politics, which is being played out on the streets, through social media, in, in sort of interpersonal relations. And that in itself is quite interesting and I think is a reflection of something of the crisis of, of formal democracies that we're seeing across the world. And into that space of, of failed formal political processes, we've now got a space in which it, new voices are, are, are appearing and appearing very actively. Um, maybe we could um, bring Peter in at this point. And um, on this issue of the, the range of voices that we are hearing from, because on the one hand we might have a confident um, uh, mainstream business community who are welcoming opportunities for public investment in infrastructure change. We've got the more radical voices of Extinction Rebellion. We've got the, the distinctive youth voice. I wonder to what degree you think there are synergies in these different voices and tensions. Uh, there are certainly both. Um, <clears throat> I think, going back to what we've been saying so far with the IPCC report and the emphasis on the need to speed up and deepen transitions, that's resonated in a whole series of communities. So you see the business community moving towards, or some aspects of that community, towards the embrace of science-based targets, for example. So you have Unilever and you know Tesco's and one or two other companies uh, working with NGOs to try and realign their corporate strategies with what they consider to be a 1.5 or a 2 degree pathway. So they're taking seriously the new trajectory, the sense of urgency and trying to shift business practices in a different direction. There are clearly other parts of the business community where that's not been the reaction and we've seen BP and Shell and other more incumbent actors um, projecting oil extraction that would largely blow the Paris remaining Paris Agreement budget. Um, but that aligns, that sort of sense of urgency, the need to shift things, to think fundamentally about models, does reflect, I think, the ways in which um, citizens and youth movements are mobilising around these issues, the sort of real sense in which we need to do politics differently, um, moves towards having representation for future generations in parliaments, as we're seeing in Wales and Israel and Hungary and places like that, uh, demands to lower the voting age, these sorts of things, to try and bring more voices in, um, and to hold more incumbent actors to account for their inactions, frankly, on, on many of these issues. One of the other new elements to this is the strength with which there has been a voice and a call for extra parliamentary action. We've seen the rise of the interest in citizens' assemblies and citizens' juries. And I wonder to what degree you think that could make a genuine contribution or is that merely decoration around the formal political process? Um, it runs the danger of being mere decoration, but I think that it's an opening and it's an opportunity that we have to try and engage with and use. And I see um, interesting signs, you know, talking to councillors as, as I have done locally, there's cross-party buy-in and support for these some of these processes. There are obviously lots of details to be worked out around what's the mandate of those assemblies, how seriously will their suggestions get taken by local councils, how much power and authority and resources do councils have then to act on them as opposed to national level governments. But I think, you know, these are, this is a new site of experimentation. It's a new way of bringing other voices into the process. And going back to some of the issues we've alluded to already, you need to bring people with you. Um, you know, getting to, to net zero can't be through top-down imposed policies of one sort or another. So having some broader public mandate around, you know, building some consensus around desirable pathways moving forward is really important. And citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries are one part of that process, I think. I'm interested in the degree to which... Um, for so many years, we have been aware of the nature and the scale of the problem, and all of you are people who've worked on these issues for a very long time. Mm -hmm. There's now a new wave of people becoming involved at, who are reacting to their encounter with the nature of the science and what has to be done by when, with sort of shock and, and, and despair and all the rest of it. And I, I'd like to ask each of you, um, what is it that has kept you going so long and from where you draw your energy to keep um, working in this field? And let, let's, let's start with Ian. Thank you for pointing out my great age. But um, 
I mean, I, I think, you know, more and more you investigate these issues and engage with these issues, you, re you realise how important they are. So, I mean, that, that obviously is the motivating factor. But I think one of the things that emerged out of this book was there are solutions out there, there are possibilities out there, but they're political, and we have to continue to engage both as, both as academics but also as citizens, and I, I don't necessarily want to divide, have a sharp dividing line between that. Um, but how you do that, I think, relates to some of the points that have just been made in our conversation so far. There is a tendency, and Melissa raised this earlier on, to, and I think this is, this is often projected by people who are recent to the issue, that this is all new, sudden, must be dealt with now, you know, we've got to deal with it by 2030 or 2025 or, or e even tomorrow. I agree with all of that. But how do you deal with system change? I mean, the slogan that I like that's merged out of these movements recently is not climate change, but system change. And in a way, if there was going to be a tagline for, the, for this book, and we weren't clever enough to do that, but that would be the sort of thing. We've got to see the, see the issues of broader structural change um, linked to this. And that does mean relating these questions of environment and climate change to the fundamental questions of how capitalism as it exists today has created these problems. And unless people understand that, then we're not going to be able to do any of these things, no matter what businesses do, no matter what deadlines government sets, no matter what claims citizen movements uh, 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 raise. And I think that's a really important point, is that that system change of the way capitalism, forms of capitalism, affect uh, the global environment is the, the crux of it. And yes, it's urgent. It was quite interesting, actually, during the construction of this book, between the authors, and you can see the tensions as you read through the book, there was a big debate about urgency. And I think we all agreed that the, these are urgent problems, but the question is, do they need to be done fast? I think that there's a distinction between urgency and speed. Sometimes an urgent thing needs to be done carefully and properly and solidly, because otherwise you just paper over the cracks. And you know we've seen this in environmental responses since since. Unless we deal with this much more fundamentally, then I think these things will persist. And that's why I really think, and this is, this is new since this period, and we didn't use this, this language, but in a way you could ar argue that this book is a call for a Green New Deal of various forms. You know, a fundamental structural transformation of economy and its, uh, its implications for environment. And if Green New Deals are to take off anywhere, it's got to come through a democratic process. And that doesn't mean just fig leaf democracy and just attempts at you know, assemblies and this and that. This is fundamental shifts in the way that we think that we need to run economies and run societies. And I think that's what we talk about when we think about transformation. That's the transformation. And, and it's the vision of those sort of transformations that, despite my great age, it keeps me yeah. going. I'm going to put the same question to Melissa, mm. but I'm going to mm. add on to that, the, of the, mm. the, the tale of Ian's um, remarks. On this issue of urgency, now, the climate science for a reasonable chance of staying within 1.5, if you include equity in that, <coughs> points to, according to um, the climate scientist Kevin Anderson, us needing to see emissions reductions of north of 10% mm. year on year. And I wonder whether, to use the phrase, actually existing capitalism can, can deal with that? Or, or, or do we need something really fundamentally very different? Well, I'm going to come to that, but I'm going to backtrack to your original question, which is what has motivated you to keep going. And for me, it's partly what Ian said, but it's also the justice question, because I've spent most of my career not just trying to work towards understandings and practices that can support social justice, but being angry very often about the ways in which narrow approaches to environmental and green issues have actually ridden roughshod over people's rights, people's livelihoods, people's concerns, with a particular concern for often marginalised people living in parts of the global south, but also poorer people living in this country as well. 
And um, there's a chapter that I was part of in this book um, called Who's Green? And it talked about the ways in which certain versions of green can end up being green grabs for other people. So you take a take a forest and suddenly redefine it as a carbon fortress to capture to capture the emissions of people in one part of the world, and you end up dispossessing local forest dwellers and and creating all, all, a host of problems for them. There are many other examples. So I've been consistently anxious and actually even more so now in the last couple of years with these debates about urgency and emergency about the the ways in which that that urgency can drive precisely the kind of green fixes um, which can cause tremendous injustice um, and I think we see it I mean, even in the period since this book was written there's um, in response to, to climate there's been an enormous acceleration in investment in geoengineering solutions to to, to deal with the urgency of, of climate deadlines and equally the, the market fixes which which work around pricing nature selling nature to save it um, have moved on in force through processes of natural capital and and biodiversity offsetting and so on so I think the dangers that we were seeing in 2015 are magnified several fold this time so so part of how I come at these issues is constantly to argue for those equity points now um, to come back to your question about capitalism inequities are deeply built into processes of capitalist change and that's why we need system change which is is doing capitalism differently actually um, it's not going to be a simple neat trade-off between okay we can manage manage the equity concerns around this forest or around this 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 climate response we actually have to think differently about how we build processes that tackle inequality into into the systems we're working with and we have to build equity considerations into the way we're the way we're thinking about environmental changes and interventions and that's something I've thought about since and have been writing about since the publication of this book. Those tensions that you point Mm. out between the speed of action and respect for deliberative democratic procedures and proper consideration of um, social justice and rights is something which is, is probably the, the tension is probably going to get worse and I wonder if you could just think out loud for a moment about how we might go about squaring that circle I mean if it's argued that climate breakdown and irreversible global heating is will be one of the greatest injustices in terms of the distribution of impacts etc can you imagine a circumstance in which um, that circle can be squared and that we can act with speed but with social justice and proper democratic procedure? Well, I think some of the the arguments and new policy frameworks that are now emerging around green new deals, but more specifically green and just new deals, begin to do precisely that within local government settings, within national settings. I think the global justice issues are are, are more difficult to deal with because they really relate to global governance processes which we know are deeply inequitable and and often dominated by players who don't want to I mean by the US and by China who do not want to play the game as it were Um, so I think that's those those global justice questions I think need to be need to be dealt with rather differently and they need reforms actually of the 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 global governance around around sustainability and around around economy but I think we've got actually some very promising examples um, nationally and locally and often in the cases of local governments and city governments and so on where you really are beginning to think about economy and, and environment and and social questions in an integrated and 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 different way and those are the examples we need to to work with and build on um so peter here we are in the middle of um what's been called the long emergency what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning and keeps you fighting the fight um well some of it's some of the things we've talked about so far it's new actors coming onto the the scene and reinvigorating and re-energizing politics and again you know the the students and uh, youth movements i think are, are really important in that regard bringing fresh perspectives demanding new uh, change uh, holding actors to account there's that type of thing but i guess also as some of people have alluded to already as well is the need to showcase the really positive things that are going on all around the world in different sectors and and places the type of thing we're trying to do with the rapid transition alliance 
is generate and showcase what we call evidence-based hope um, to try and show the types of things that are possible um, in you know socially progressive ways um, that are dealing with you know a whole range of different sustainability issues around energy and water and food and use of land and all those sorts of things. Um, and then using that as an advocacy tool to try and hold other actors to account, to ask other councils or governments, well, why aren't you doing this? This was possible in Bogota and Colombia. This was possible in London. Why is it not possible in Leeds? You know, using that sort of ev growing evidence base about things that are going on around the world, you know, right now in different places and across sectors. But also looking back historically, you know, we, there are precedents for, for dealing with some of these challenges. And we've already talked about the Green New Deal. We had a, a new deal before mm. under Roosevelt. You know, there have been big rollouts of you know, new infrastructures, different technologies, mm. you know, social transformations uh, around gender and racial inequalities and all sorts of things uh, that offer useful lessons, I think, for how to try and manage and ride waves of social change in more uh, progressive and inclusive ways. So I think capturing, documenting and using politically that sort of store of evidence to try and push more, uh, more progressive change, I think, is really important. So reflecting again on the themes of the book and poised as we are here with a seemingly worsening evidence base coming through from the science about the actual nature of the climate emergency, um, you could argue that we're poised between um, a future of great possibility as um, systems respond to the crisis or um, a bit of a Hobbesian nightmare where there's a sort of a competitive, selfish, individualistic kind of grab for whatever you can get. Which way do you think it's going to fall, Ian? Well, I'm not going to predict, but uh, for me, speaking personally, I think there's a lot of hope out there. I mean, Pete's been talking about the various examples, historic and contemporary, and there are quite a few in this book. No one would have believed that the, the scale of renewable energy that is delivering clean-ish energy, not completely so, today would have would have existed even even when we were writing this book it wasn't even predicted so things can change and things can change quite fast other things change more slowly and i think that's that's uh, a key lesson because if we look across these examples where things have changed where hope is there which is countering the fear and the anxiety and the sort of you know, mass depression that, that sometimes overtakes environmental movements, I think by offering that hope and seeing these possibilities really does create a new type of politics. But all of these examples are ones where transformations have stuck through democratic processes. You are not going to impose these things just by diktat. So I think the uh, hope also has to go with a hopeful politics of reinvigorating forms of democracy, which will go with this form of, uh, of, of, of green transformation. Because if we look at it, and this is Melissa's point before, the ways that um, environmental uh, problems are distributed around the world are such that the poorest and some of the poorest and the most marginalised people, North and South, are the people who are at the front line confronting climate change or environmental change. Unless we deal with that, and that bigger political question of, of justice and, and economic change that goes with that, we're not going to deliver this. So it's not just about more windmills, it's actually about mm. more democracy which will deliver mm. these changes. And that's, I think, where I'm more positive because I think we have no option but to do that. Melissa, are you positive in the same way? I, I am positive. Um, the things I would, I would add are that I think in writing this book and in observing around the world since then, we've also come to understand that big transformations, and look back historically as well, don't happen through single control-oriented sets of decisions. It's more about the, the coming together of multiple, often to begin with quite disparate pathways, to use a term we've, we've used a lot in the, in the Step Centre. And if you look back at how some of the really big transformations have, have happened, um, whether it's the vote for women or the ending of slavery and so on, actually that's the way they began. And I think that is what we're seeing now. I mean, the distributed sort of solar, solar revolution happening in the countryside and towns around the world has not been the diktat of, of anybody in, in particular. It's been a distributed process which then reaches almost a point of a, of a, of a shift in social norms. You could even talk about it as a social tipping point in, in some respects. Um, 
where, where I'm, I'm still reflecting, actually, and I think that the question is really out, is whether that kind of democracy and multiplicity from below is enough or whether actually now we're in a world where we need a bit more regulation and actually actually state action which is supportive of those pathways but actually quite explicit about closing down on others and and saying something simply won't do the nature of our current fossil fuel economy the ways certain corporations are acting um, and and I think we may well need that combination. It was a combination we talked about in this book, mm. and and I think the evidence now points to the real importance of that of that combination. You need the pressure from below. You need the examples. You need the multiple pathways. But at a certain point, you need to have public action, which is supportive and which actually challenges some of the the motorways which are moving us in really very dangerous directions too. Well, that's an interesting challenge for the international architecture as well, because you could argue, perhaps it's a crude caricature, but in terms of global institutions and the way the global economy is run, um, there are many sticks um, and hard checks and balances if people step out of line in term, as, as nations in terms of... Um, how they perform in, in a neoliberal global economy. Uh, if you um, raise borders, there are sanctions. Where adherence to social and environmental aspirations and ambitions are concerned, these are normally yeah. much more sort of soft policy exhortations mm -hmm. for which if you don't live up to them, there's not really much of a penalty. So if we were going to see that kind of approach, that kind of regulatory uh, approach, which would obviously have to work at a global level, can you imagine the circumstances under which it would have the teeth to become truly operational? I mean, it's, it's difficult. I think, I think there's more that can be done actually with economic in incentives, with global tax regimes and, and so on. Um, I think there are also governance frameworks which, which actually just need to be enforced. I mean, look at, we, we, we have many of the, the agreements in place actually, and the architectures are there in the Paris agreements and so on. Um, the problem lies in, in actually the, the politics which enable some, some states and some leaders to evade them. And we've got a problem of leadership in many of, the, many of the, the countries and many of the large players on that global stage right, right now. Um, so I suppose what I'm interested yeah. in is that there seems to be a fundamental asymmetry between if you break the rules in terms of, say, for example, your, you know, your uh, Article 4 agreement with the IMF, um, you, get, you, can, you, can, you can be hammered. There are hard sanctions on that. Mm. Um, if that happens in terms of your, uh, your, your, your climate ambitions or, or your adherence to labor rights, there doesn't seem to be the, kind of the, the teeth to actually see it implemented. And I wondered if that's kind of yeah. missing... Yeah. Link. Well, I'll hand this one to Pete, who's our international <laughs> relations expert yeah. in this in this discussion. Oh, I'm not sure about expert, but I think I mean there's basically I think we need to think about root and branch reform of the key global economic institutions that you're alluding to, which I take to be the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. Um, their mandates are not fit for purpose in the given the current context we have, and precisely the sorts of issues you're alluding to. I mean, a question a colleague and I asked many years ago was, whose rules rule? And that's really the thing, that trade rules, investment rules seem to trump labour rights, environmental mm -hmm. standards, time and time again, and that's just no longer possible or plausible or compatible with the sorts of responses that are now required. So to go back to what Ian was saying earlier, we really have to get to the economic roots of, of the problem. You know, you can't have an economy that rewards the pursuit of lower standards environmentally or otherwise. You can't have an economy that, um, you know, products can be exported without any sorts of carbon taxes or regulations on how they're produced, these sorts of things. You know, that's, we, we have to sort of go for, you know, fundamental root, root and branch reform of how the global economy is ruled and organised, and that includes those global institutions. Now, some people have said we need a World Environment Organisation, some sort of weighty counter to those bodies. I'm not completely convinced that's the right way to go, but we absolutely need to rewrite the rules of those existing bodies. So, um, Melissa was talking about mm. pathways, and mm. as we all know, paths are made by walking. Mm. I wonder, in light of what you've just said, what would be your next step? What would be my next step? Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, trying to develop a series of key demands around the sorts of things we're talking about here, that's the next move. You know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about let's tell the truth, let's bring more actors into the circle and uh, the decision-making space through citizens' assemblies. 
but what we really need now are a set of concrete ideas around a Green New Deal, a Green Just New Deal. Um, we need to think about the global governance reform that needs to take place. Um, and going back to what others were saying, I think, you know, liberal in our politics, but not in our economics necessarily. We do have to put down certain limits uh, that certain ways of, of making profit and generating wealth are no longer legitimate. They, would, they haven't been sustainable for a long time, but we just can't afford for them to carry on being um, you know, seen as legitimate pathways to make mm. money. So that does mean putting down limits. It means things like a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Uh, it may mean taking away the licenses to operate of certain corporations whose activities and the ways in which they make money are not compatible with life on Earth, frankly. So, Ian, um, if you were sitting down now and you were writing out a fantasy contents list for a book to follow up on the one that we've been talking about, what would be in it? Good question. Um, I think, I mean, I think the content's not bad as it was, mm. but um, I think the, the things that perhaps were missing was perhaps some sections on more or less what Pete was just saying now, just now. Some reflection on what would the global governance architecture and, as it were, the a, a, a new framework for creating green transformations at a global level. I think that mm. was probably not mm -hmm. in there. Um, there was a lot of talk about alliances, alliance building across actors, which I think is, is the basis for that, but something a little bit more substantial on that. Uh, the chapter on finance, I think, is a really good one, but I think there's more to be said on finance and how, how green transformations can be financed. I mean, I think what we're seeing with these debates about Green New Deals and so on now is that environment is now firmly coming into economic policy and about time too. Um, we can't just have environment in, frankly, in, in world environmental organisations or environmental treaties and so on. Environment and sustainability questions have to be absolutely at the core of economic management and those that does mean carving out pathways for national and indeed the global economy that have, as Pete said, limits and, and restrictions and, and a governance framework. And I think something more about that would be in there. Um, but I still can commend the book as being thoroughly relevant to, yeah. to 2019 and indeed 2020 and beyond, because I, this is an issue that's not going to go away. Well, I'm delighted you say that about finance, because as one of the members of the original Green New Deal group, we've just published a report um, looking at how to finance the Green New Deal. Um, Melissa, what would be on your fantasy contents list? Um, I think there would be more about activism actually, and, and there would be a proliferation of examples of exactly the sort of thing we've been talking about in this, in, in this discussion, about the really positive, hopeful examples and evidence that's emerging around the world. We've got some in the book, and we have a chapter about those and about the ways that small initiatives can scale up, and we look at those in relation to things like food sovereignty and transition towns. But I think we've got a plethora of further examples. I think um, I would like to see more about national economic transformations and actually exemplars of, of national policy where where the economic and, and the environmental are, are fundamentally entwined with each other and I think that could respond to what we're learning about the sustainable development goals. Of course this book was written just as the SDGs were launched and at a time when the SDGs were being thought of as almost a set of separate 17 goals and 169 targets and I think what we've learned in the intervening period is that they need to be thought of as a package which can guide and help to shape those pathways over the next period. I think we might have addressed that issue really quite explicitly and looked at how different countries were dealing, dealing with the SDGs. And finally, I, I think we would now deal very explicitly with the politics of emergency framings, their pros and their cons, and who gains and who loses, and what gains and what loses, from pitching the need for green transformation in, in the way that we're now in 2019 seeing it being argued for. I'm going to take the bait of that comment and, and come to Peter and um, say almost to, as a cue from again from the climate science about how much has to be achieved, how quickly if we are to stay a reasonable chance of staying the right side of the 1.5 degree target. Now, books like PhDs take quite a long time to produce. I wonder, do you think any differently now working on this issue about where we should be putting our energies or indeed how we can be putting books to good use 
how they might serve the wider campaign for action. Yeah, I mean, I think there are there are limits to how much books can achieve directly in that sense. I mean, books are largely for academics and others, but some of the messages and debates that they deal with can be communicated in more interesting and immediate and relevant ways. As you as you were alluding to, there's often a huge time lag between the production of a book uh, and when it actually hits the shelves. Um, and these are very fast moving debates. Um, and as we've been talking uh, throughout this conversation, more and more actors are engaging with them. So I think we have to think about videos and blogs and briefings and you know getting these discussions out there, communicating them in new and interesting ways, uh, and showcasing you know what we what we know and what's out there. So it's been. Um A fascinating conversation and a timely one, but it's a fast-moving debate and we're looking forward to a new year. And I wonder what you individually, let's start with Peter, uh, what's your next intervention on the climate emergency going to be? I think uh, for all of us in a way this has to come back home, not just to the places we live but also the places we work. And there's increasing discussion about universities Uh, some of whom, including our own here at Sussex, has declared a climate emergency. So thinking about what that actually means, both in terms of how we do our research, how we conduct our research, how much we fly, for example, um, the infrastructures in which we work, all of these sorts of things are really pushing the the agenda um, very close to home about where we work, about what we can contribute in a sort of very immediate physical uh, sense, as well as through our research and communication activities. Melissa, what's next for you? Well, I can answer that in two ways. Um, Over the next few months, IDS will be launching a new strategy which has climate and environmental change and disruption at its heart and centre. And we'll be looking to to launch and and get going some big new initiatives around climate and environmental justice and around looking for and building these politics of hope in a really difficult context. So I'll be putting a lot of energy into working with colleagues in that area. And and in my own work, um, I do a great deal these days both on food and on health, both of which offer lenses in which to think about um, action in relation to climate and ecology and environment, where these questions about the balance between emergency and equity are absolutely centre stage. So I'll be continuing to write and work with colleagues in in West Africa and in other parts of the world on those issues too. It sounds like lectures, conferences and research papers are going to be much more exciting places to be in the future. Um, Ian, what's next for you? Well, we were having a discussion about this in the, within the Step Centre the other day, and this book obviously emerged out of the collectivity that exists around the Step Centre on the Sussex campus. And we were thinking ahead to the COP26 in, in Glasgow at the end of 2020, and thinking, you know, in the crowded area of debate around cl- the climate emergency... Um, Where can we intervene? What's the sort of longer term work that the STEP Centre has been doing over the last 15 years that can contribute to that? And it it is actually, at one level, quite humble, really, documenting cases based on solid empirical research that demonstrate that different pathways towards a low-carbon future, towards a green transformation, can be possible. So in, in that language, it is about a politics of hope, but documenting it solidly and, and, uh, and demonstrating that that is around which, these are examples around which um, debates at the, at the COP can, can focus. Because I suspect the COP will be a lot about the targets, a lot about the deadlines, a lot about the, the science, all of which is fine. But unless we have a vision for where we go beyond that, particularly if we don't meet the targets then we can get into a more doomsday scenario. And I don't think that's the way to go because the environmental movement from way back has had these two tensions that you raised before, this sort of doomsday, the end of the world, this and that from the 1960s to a more hopeful, what's the future of our planet? And I think that's where we have to latch on to. And I think we've done a lot of research around the Step Centre which shows exactly what can be done. And it can be done and is being done. And that's quite exciting, I think. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So it sounds like um, that old line about how more clean air, more green collar jobs, more comfortable homes to live in, what's not to like? Transformation sounds like the the Alliance for Rapid Transition is going to have um, a much bigger evidence base and a lot more friends. 
Well, certainly. I mean, there's the uh, there's there's real potential for for thinking in new ways, and I think you know one of the things that academics can do, in the luxury that we have in writing books and convening conversations of this sort, is bring people together. So I think that's that's where we're at. Well, that's a wonderful note to finish on. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks for listening. We wish all of our listeners a very happy new year and look forward to more fascinating debates in 2020. As ever, we'd love to hear from you, so please do email us at betweenthelines at ids.ac.uk with any comments or suggestions. Or tweet us at ids underscore UK hashtag idsbetweenthelines. <laughs>